Hi, Alex. How are you? Hey, Tanya. Good to see you. Let's give everybody a couple of minutes uh, to get in. We'll give it a another minute or so. How are you doing? Did you have a have a good productive day? I did. I had a very productive day. Cool. I did some writing today. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. What were you writing about? Um, Rick Owens. Ooh. You know, he's Mexican American. So I was writing about his oh. collection that he did about his parents. No. Oh. <laughs> I have some Rick Owens shoes. Ooh, and, fancy. Uh, yeah. Maybe we should. I'll be our own separate uh, private. Anyway, welcome everybody. Hi everybody. Welcome to Hugh Live. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's. I just want to welcome you all. I'm so happy that you came by. Um, this is the March 4, 2021 episode of Hugh Live, FIT's webcast series. It, it, Hugh Live is a collection of intimate conversations with noteworthy people in fashion, business, and other creative fields, most of whom happen to be FIT alumni. I'm Alex Joseph. I am the college's chief storyteller, and I'm also one of the editors of FIT's Hugh magazine, for which these talks are named. You can visit hugh.fitnyc.edu to read our current issue, which will feature tonight's guest. Uh, we're still laying that out, but it should be live in the next couple of days. Uh, I am also an alumnus with a degree in the same program that Tanya has a degree in, um, the, M the master's degree program in fashion and textile studies, history, theory, museum practice, class of 2015 for me. Um, if you will post about tonight's chat, if you plan to post about it, can you please remember to tag hashtag FIT alumni in your posts? And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. It's her name is Tanya Melendez Escalante. Tanya grew up in Mexico City and taught at the Universidad Latinoamericana in Mexico before moving to New York to earn her MA as a Fulbright scholar, we would like to point out. Uh, and at the time that was uh, the master's degree was called Museum Studies, Costume and Textiles. Today, she is the Senior Curator for Education and Public Programs for the Museum at FIT. In 2019, she was accepted to participate in the Executive Education Program for the Next Generation of Museum Leaders, organized by the Getty Leadership Institute at Claremont Graduate University. And she wants me to point out that she is particularly proud of her essay on Mexican pink that she contributed to the Museum at FIT's 2018 exhibition, Pink, the history of a punk, pretty, powerful color. So uh, the evening is going to go this way. Uh, Tanya and I will just uh, chat uh, for about 35 or so minutes. And uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we will get to them as many, uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of our conversation. The whole evening tends to run about but somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour, sort of depending. Um, but um, we will certainly be off right around seven o'clock. So Tanya, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited. Oh, that's great. Um, so when we started talking about this topic, um, I remember that you actually pointed out to me that many of the names in fashion that we think of as just boldface names are actually from Latin America. So maybe you could surprise some of our viewers who might not realize, I mean, I did not know that Rick Owens was was a Mexican, um, Mexican American or a Mexican? His parents were both uh, Mexican nationals. He he's American from California, but he's Mexican American. Mm. Yeah, so um, he did a whole collection on his heritage, on the background from his mother, who is uh, Mixtec. So that's an indigenous group from Mexico, and and in the collection he also included the work that his father did translating in courts for. Uh, immigrant farmers mm -hmm. um, so but he he says his his um his mexicanity is very abstract so, uh, okay yeah. that's interesting but, um, when we were having this conversation i thought it would be a nice thing to show that the museum at fit has an award that we give every year for the artist our artistry of fashion um, and that is the impact that designers have 
in terms of aesthetics and, and commerce. And, and so many of our honorees have actually been of Latin American descent. So um, we, we, should we see the PowerPoint, uh, the presentation at this point? Uh, can we start that? Let's see. Is a, sorry, there's a little bit, a little um, bump here. Where's the, oh, there we go. Right. Technology oh. was, um, there they are. There. So these pictures are of our um, awards um, luncheons that we do that open fashion week in New York. So if our luncheon is known for being the opening like social and fashion event of, of each uh, full fashion week. And here, our first honoree was Isabel Toledo, who is Cuban American, uh, who was uh, Cuban American. Um, recently, we had Narciso Rodriguez, who we see there with our president, Dr. Joyce Brown. Um, and there you see in the uh, bottom right, um, Oscar de la Renta with Mike Bloomberg when he was uh, mayor. And uh, Oscar was uh, president of the CFDA, not once, but twice, him being uh, Dominican born, and Carolina Herrera, who is uh, Venezuelan born. So there's all these big names in our fashion world that are of Latin American descent, but I think we don't, I think necessarily, uh, not always group them under that umbrella. That's very interesting. It, it, it is interesting. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it makes it makes me think that you know, there's this, as you had said, we'll get back to this, this idea that um, the two cultures are so porous, actually, you know, mm -hmm. in, you know, Latin American culture and, and American culture, there's this kind of back and forth. Um, also wanted to point out that Isabel Toledo is an alumna. I'm not sure if she's a graduate, but she's an alumna and she did take many classes at the college or did take classes at the college. So we're, unfortunately, we did lose uh, Ms. Toledo. Um, a great designer, but uh, they were so supportive of FIT, both her and Ruben. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, it is a shame. A real, a real talent. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me, you know, you just did a show in Mexico. Tell me a little bit about. Uh, it was in Guadalajara, Mexico. So tell me about the show. What did you do? Yeah. Um, so here are some pictures of Guadalajara. And I wanted to point out by uh, putting these two images together that Guadalajara has a very modern aspect to it. It's the second largest city in Mexico. There's a lot of business and culture that happens there, but also a lot of the uh, elements that are thought of as Mexican, like tequila or, you know, these dances um, come from Guadalajara. So it's a cultural hub for both contemporary and traditional arts. Um, and a museum in Guadalajara invited me to do an exhibition of designers who are originally from that city. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I, we said in the story that actually everyone who worked on the show, all, all the people who worked on the show were women, which is perfect because this is Women's History Month. So that's awesome. Um, so how did you choose these two designers that you chose to focus on? Well, um, in a way, the, the museum organized the exhibition and they chose the designers and they chose me. We had given a talk at this museum some time ago and the director of the museum, who, as you pointed out, is a woman, Viviana Curi, um, she saw us talking. She thought that their work was very remarkable. They saw that there was a really good report. And so at the end of this talk, she came to us and said, you know, I would love to make an exhibition of your work. And then she turned to me and said, I would love it if you would curate this exhibition. And so that's how it all started. And as we were planning the exhibition, um, Julia, who is uh, in this photograph, she's at the center of the three of us. And Renata, who is on the left side, um, they invited uh, Carla Vasquez, who is an interior designer and a product designer in Mexico, who has worked with them for many uh, in many occasions, but is also an avid collector of, of their works and has been so for uh, decades uh, to do the exhibition design. And so it, it ended up being that the designers, the exhibition designer, the curator and the director of the museum, we were all women. And it was a, um, a really wonderful experience. Uh, I, what I find really fascinating about the show, which you can sort of see in the right hand picture, 
is that um, you took an artistic approach, right? But some of the, if you can see on the left-hand side of the photograph behind the designer, that some of the um, pieces were shown on the wall in frames as if as if they were like paintings or more conventional or traditional works of art. So what was the thinking behind that? Um, I think it was, um, uh, there were multiple reasons to do that. One of them was responding to the fact that we were showing the works in a contemporary art museum. Um, so this language would be familiar to the usual visitors to the museum. But also they, um, they have this interplay between bidimensional fact like garments and then how they transform when they are worn and they are seen three dimensionally. So um, I wanted to showcase some of these transformations and one of the themes, so the exhibition is called fashion and transformation. So this was one form of transformation going from the, um, the bidimensional to the three dimensional um, garment and they are some of them changed so radically that it was actually a really interesting viewing uh, to look at. I, in this picture, you're all wearing their designs, correct? Correct. Okay. So can you maybe by talking about what you're wearing, sort of tell us about some of their trademark um, uh, aesthetics? Oh, absolutely. Um, they are known in Mexico for being uh, both avant-garde and uh, minimalist and very practical. And so I think you can see all those characteristics in what, what we all we all we are all wearing. So there's no print. The lines are um, very clean. They what I'm wearing, which doesn't really show very well because it's black, is a jumpsuit that's wrapped around the body. Um, it was incredibly comfortable to wear for an opening that lasted for many hours because we were opening during um, a pandemic, like we had a lot of restrictions. So we were in the galleries almost 12 hours. So small groups could come in and we could give tours and, you know, um, and I was comfortable from beginning to end. Um, but it was one of those garments that when you... Uh, if it was not worn, it was like this super long uh, piece of fabric that just extended for like yards and yards. Um, and I think that people sometimes when they look at their clothes on hangers, find them like very strange, like they don't look like clothes. <laughs> well, they, yeah. it's, it's interesting because they look so wearable in the, in the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, um, I want to talk a little bit more about their aesthetics, but I, but before we do that, that I think I'll be on the next slide. Tell me a little bit about, I know you had to put this show together, obviously during the pandemic, mm -hmm. like, like, how do you overcome challenges like that as a professional in, in this field? Well, I think like all of us, we had to do many things through, uh, you know, Zoom and WhatsApp and uh, all these different modes of communication that are long distance. And there were certain things that we couldn't do. So um, they have collectors all over Mexico, um, but we couldn't approach all of them because when we started planning, it was in the very early months of the pandemic and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to travel the close, like what the restrictions were going to be. It was just very challenging. Um, and at the time, the lockdown in Mexico was very strict. So people could only go out for emergency purposes. So we couldn't even go to, or they couldn't even go to people's homes and isolated look at clothes, like you couldn't get out of your house. Um, and so what we did was look at the, I had previously visited their archives. So I had an extensive, um, you know, the program at FIT trained me to, when you're in a, an archive, like juice it. So I had pictures of tons of their things already. And, and we did a, a pre-selection based on their archive. And then they reached out to local um, collectors who were willing to send us images of everything that they owned and, and tell us this is what's really special. And so at some point I was able to do one trip to Mexico to do the curatorial selection um, with the museum, with one of the uh, curators of the museum who was um, my partner in putting the exhibition together and we did all that in their um in the designers workshop okay so mm -hmm. it managed to to come about so that's great um it, it by the way just while i'm thinking about this is there um 
was there a I know there was an online exhibition also is that mm -hmm. is that a link that we could um, maybe point people toward if they wanted to go into more to see what was to see the show or has it been taken down no it's still there I just don't remember it um on the top of my head but it is still there and they did a uh, a series of public programs that where they were um it was a very again because it's a contemporary art museum their approach was slightly different to what we would do at the museum at fit where we are a fashion museum mm. so they invited creators from other disciplines to respond to the work of Julia renata and i think that was a very um insightful way of looking at, at a designer's work um mm -hmm. and so there were even like performance art workshops uh, online where people could use their garments to do a performance and record it online um, wow. and that was inspired by the exhibition and i think that that is like a fantastic idea that i think they could come up with because they come from a different discipline mm -hmm. interesting so uh, the, the museum's emphasis was on fine art, but in this part of the conversation, we're actually thinking about culture and how uh, how mm -hmm. that maybe plays out in garments. So let's talk about that. This image on the left was uh, used to promote the show, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And so tell us about that. So like, if someone were saying like, what is Mexican? I mean, hopefully they're not that literal, but if they were and they were like, what is Mexican about these looks? Like, what would you say? Yeah, well, I think that that's another aspect that I really wanted to to highlight in the exhibition was that um, Juli Renata are part of their cultural milieu. They are, um, they know many artists, they've always grown up, like their first fashion show, the producer was an art curator. And I think that really speaks to how they understand fashion as part of culture. And so this is one of the, we had two garments that we considered like the masterpieces of the exhibition. One was the uh, wedding gown that they um, draped for a local um, woman who then became one of the top culture people in, in the country later. And this is the other masterpiece. It is um, a garment that's inspired by Mexican traditional dress and particular uses um, uses a technique that's called enredo, where you pleat a piece of fabric and hold it together with a sash. And it really, the beauty of the garment is the, the pleating technique. And there's multiple pleating techniques, but here I found an, an image that has a pleating technique that's similar to what Juli Renata used in this, um, in this outfit. So when you, when it's not worn, you open it and the sash closes it. So it's not, like a traditional uh, Mexican would wear it, where it is uh, a piece of fabric that then they pleat and style with the sash. This is more like a skirt, but it it, it was a, um, with the sewing machine, they created the pleats and then they just um, stuck them together with the sash. Uh, but you still get that same look. Um, so, but if you look at this, if, if a woman is wearing this on the streets, you might not necessarily see this reference. Um, it's, uh, it really, you, somebody would have to explain it to you. And I think that would be true, not only for foreign eyes, but even for Mexican eyes. It's not that evident. It's, it's more subtle. Mm. So it's like, it is like a piece of modern art in the sense that it requires interpretation. It doesn't lay itself out literally to be understood in the most overt way. You have to do a little bit of work. Okay, cool. Correct. So and I think good. that many of their collections have that, um, that characteristic that sometimes they might be referencing, for example, they really love the desert. Um, and, and natural landscapes. And so there will be connect. Uh, there was one collection where, where they were um, paying homage to the textures of the earth. And when you saw the garment by itself, it wasn't clear at all. But if you put it together with an image from a desert, mm. you, it, it was like, of course, this is clear. Um, but you really had to see them side by side a little bit like you have to see this skirt side by side with this garment and then you see the connection. Yeah, this this is this comparison that you've made here is something would be completely over obviously over my head, but it, I'm so glad you pointed it out because once now that you see it, you start sort of getting it. And I think that's mm -hmm. so great. 
Let's talk about you a little bit, actually. Um, you know, you actually grew up in Mexico, correct? I did. I grew up in Mexico. I uh, I came to live in New York the first time in when I went to FIT, I was 27. And then I permanently moved to New York when I was 31. Mm -hmm. And here's a picture of Tanya, little Tanya. You need to point out which one is little Tanya. <laughs> There's a, I'm the little one wearing the tall boots. <laughs> And so Alex asked me, um, when did my interest in fashion start when we were having like the casual conversations about tonight? And I thought that this um, picture from me in daycare encapsulates that I guess I was always interested in fashion uh, because this specific day, um, it was one of those like come and see your kids in action in school. And my mom was like dragging me out of home. And I was like, I am not going to school without my boots. And so at some point, my mom was like, whatever, boots are black shoes and your uniform calls for black shoes, just wear the darn boots. Um, so I still to this day love black tall boots. <laughs> so uh, did, you, did you have any, you had fashion in your background too, right? Your, mm -hmm. your family. So tell us about that. Uh, my mom uh, studied to be a pattern maker and she taught uh, pattern making and sewing for a few years before uh, becoming a middle school teacher. So she was always sewing at home and she would make clothes. Like if I I had like these ideas, I would see like a Carolina Herrera gown in, in a magazine and I'd be like, oh, I wanna like a, a skirt like this. So my mom would indulge me and like make a, like I remember um, what uh, Christian Lacroix, like these bubble skirts and I'd be like, how can we do this? And my mom would be like, this is, um, God is punishing me or something. But um, so I, I, and I would always be looking for styles that to me were hard to find in the stores. Um, just asked for someone to make them for me. And I was like avidly looking for fabrics in the fabric stores that would replicate the ideas that I had in my head. But as a maker, I have no patience, so I could never be a fashion designer. I have great respect for them because I have two left hands for sewing. Yeah, I, I, for the grad program, we had to do that stitch notebook. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Each row of stitches was like eight hours for me. I, <laughs> I have no hand skills, but um, but then anyway, so you so your mother was wrong you you had discovered a passion and it became your career so good thing for you good that you did all that how did you come to new york what brought you to new york um well i was um after my passion uh, you know when i was growing up in high school there was no ba degree in fashion in mexico at least at least in not, not in mexico city and not that i was aware of um and so I really wanted to go to the university. And my mom said, uh, again, a big influence said to me, you have to do something that you really love. So when you go to work, it's not work, but something that really feeds like because it's a pleasure um, and you'll be more successful. You'll you'll be able to be the best that you can be because you're doing something that you actually like. So I really loved fashion, but I also really loved museums. And so when I said, okay, there's no alternative for me to go to university and study fashion, I'll do art history. And so very early on, I started interning in museums and I, I thought this is what I want to do. And I went, I went to a couple of openings and I thought this is the most glamorous thing. I want to organize openings. And, and, and so I graduated and I was teaching at the university when I started looking at uh, master's programs in arts administration. And as I was, uh, and I wanted to study abroad, do uh, um, my MA somewhere that was not Mexico. And, and so I just stumbled into uh, FIT's website and I found museum studies for fashion and cost, fashion and cost, costume and fashion. Um, so that, that was the perfect mix of my two passions and mm. rest is history. So now when I, I'd like, I want you to tell us a little bit about what it was like to study fashion in the United States. And when I asked you about this, the first time you told this great story about pennies, actually, um, people, uh, hopefully people remember, actually, pennies are still around. So it, tell me about that. Is, yes. Um, so it's, um, 
when I started writing my papers for grad school, I, uh, I always liked contemporary fashion. So I was like, I am not going to be writing about 19th century fashion because I just really love contemporary fashion. So I would get myself into all sorts of trouble by picking contemporary clothes. And so at some point I find these men's 70s uh, polyester shirts that I decided was the most fascinating topic in the world. <laughs> I started doing my research. I looked and I see the name of this um, manufacturer um, that ended up being sold in JC Pennies. And yeah. Yeah. I was like, okay, so let me go into the encyclopedias and see if anybody has written about this manufacturer or about these JC Pennies, because I had no idea of the meaning of either. Um, and so this funny, but uh, I think for a lot of international students, that might be um, a common experience that everything is so new that you really have to like dig in the randomest pla places because you don't know that JC Penney's is, I don't know, a department store that's uh, and what it means in American culture. Um, that when I moved to New York and I started working at the museum at FIT, I thought I had to start from scratch with American fashion. What is what I don't have to start from scratch with? And I thought Mexican fashion, like I would know the equivalent of a JCPenney in Mexico without having to look in, in an encyclopedia where I wouldn't find it. So yeah, and that's what happened to me. I was like looking in the wrongest places for information about a retailer. Yeah. So you <laughs> ended up, but you ended up doing your thesis on these two designers. That's Mm -hmm. interesting tell us tell us a little bit about this thesis did it did it did it end up being useful for you down the line it sounds like it did it did um it was uh what i did was i studied what back then didn't have a like a proper name of ethical fashion practices of christina kim who's based in la and carla fernandez um, who is based in mexico city um, at the time, I was um, a fellow at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in the education department, and um, Christina Kim had just been the honoree um, for um, the National Design Awards. So they had this huge pile of her work, and I started looking at it, and I thought, this is so interesting, and it is so similar to what Carla Fernandez does in Mexico, and I had recently met Carla through a mutual friend, and, and so I wanted to go deeper into their idea of sustainability, but also of um, better labor practices and supporting artisans and um, preserving crafts that were at risk of disappearing because of technology, et cetera, et cetera. And what I discovered and what was the, at the heart of my thesis was that depending on where your brand is based, certain uh, things are easier, certain things are harder, and the, um, the reading of your work is slightly different depending on, on where you're based. And so particularly with Carla Fernandez, um, this started a, a, a very like deep collaboration and over the years it's become a very dear friendship. That's beautiful. It's, I, I think the question of ethical fashion is something that we'll be talking about more and more in at FIT, which I think is a, that's a very good development. So thanks for helping put us on that path. <laughs> it only took, that was 20 years ago, which sounds crazy. I cannot believe I wrote this thesis almost 20 years ago. Gosh, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Um, so, um, so now you are the senior curator of education for the museum. Um, so you have both, a cur so you have curator and education in your title, which is so fascinating. I, I'm imagining that some of the people who are paying attention to this conversation might very well want to get into curating and, mm -hmm. and or museum education. Can you talk a little bit about how you got, how you got interested in the position, how you pursued the position, what advice you might give? to someone mm -hmm. you know i um i as i as my mother was a pattern maker both my mother and my father um, are educators and so and my sister is an educator and i was trained to be an educator before i came to fit and so um audiences and the understanding that audiences have of exhibitions and of collections has always been very important to me and even when i was a uh, teaching at Universidad Latinoamericana, 
I was not teaching art, but I organized um, a symposium on how museum educators and teachers could better connect to take advantage of museum collections. And I like applied for a grant and I came up with this idea and I just thought it was a really important role that museums have in educating or in facilitating audiences uh, enjoyment and understanding of what museums have to offer. And so as my career has evolved, I've always accepted any position that's come my way, which I, to me, that would be the main piece of advice to anybody who's uh, seeking employment in museums. Like, I think it's very unusual that somebody will land the, that they really want on their first try. So, um, so I'd say, take any job, you'll learn something that will become useful. Uh, when the day comes that the job that you actually want becomes available and then you have like this big uh like bunch of assets that you bring to the table mm -hmm. and so when i came to fit i was very pregnant about to give birth and this position that opened was an uh as i said to you a glorified assistantship <laughs> that was putting together uh, opening receptions and doing a couple of um events here and there and I was like, well, I'm going to have a newborn. I'd like, this is the right amount of work that I'll probably be able to manage. But very quickly, um, my enthusiasm got the better of me, and we started programming more and more and more. And then Val, very Valerie Steele, Dr. Valerie Steele is the director of the museum at FIT. And one day she uh, called me in her office and asked me and said, you know, I want to start an education department in the museum. Um, and would you like to help me with this project? And create the education department with me. And so we were, when we were having the conversations about um, the department and what this title uh, would, would entail, sorry, um, we this curator has this creative um, uh, role of generating ideas and putting together um, narratives, right? So, so we agreed that that could be the role of the head of education department that you um, put together projects or uh, narratives for the audiences to have better access to exhibitions and collections. And that's how they bo both come together. And as years have passed, I've uh, created more and more uh, like complicated projects that sometimes have education with curatorial bents or curation with educational bents and uh i've begun writing more and more so mm. it's it's um it's, it's been a very a, a wonderful opportunity to work at the museum at fit i'm very grateful well it sounds like one piece of advice that that i'm hearing is don't get too focused on one role if you want to work in a museum you know you just make yourself available and i mean of course you want to have a goal but you, you don't get mm -hmm. too fixated on it what if you're have you had certain highlights as, as in working at the museum that you'd like to that you could pluck out? Obviously, the pink uh, essay was important. Other projects that you've really liked working on? You know, I created this project called Cross Pollination, and to me, that is um, a cultural exchange project. I really believe that when people from different backgrounds who look at the world from different ways get together and work together wonderful things um, are generated. Um, and so this is a project where I wanted to put together FIT New York, like FIT students who were studying in New York with students in other countries where they could work together in a common project. And so over the years, this project has grown. And um, first we, we started with Mexico because I had a lot of contacts in universities there. I had worked in one university and I knew the people and I knew that they would be interested in a similar project. But uh, by now we've done multiple cross-pollinations and we've worked with Colombia, we, we've worked with um, South Korea, we've uh, worked with Singapore. Um, and it, it, it's just been uh, really a wonderful way of meeting colleagues in other museums and in other institutions, but also seeing students um, who then have gone off to do wonderful things. So like there was one um, student who was part of our eco fashion and they're always related to an exhibition at the museum. So we had eco fashion going green. Um, we had a cross pollination and one of the students now does um, 
ecologically sourced and re recycled and repurposed um, furniture in, in Mexico. And, and I, I really like seeing that that this exchange of ideas then generates a, 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 a career path for someone, for example. It's great. I can really hear how these uh, projects really build on other work that you've done throughout your career. It totally, it seems very syn synchronized in a way. Um, maybe let's talk now a little bit about the topic at hand, although the, this mm -hmm. whole you know, presentation is the topic, but the, um, we, we had asked the question sort of like, what is Mexican fashion? And you responded with a number of really interesting ideas. Let's let's start talking about some of those. Um, well, I think that uh, Mexican fashion culture is very intertwined with other forms of cultural production. The way I explained with um, Juli and Renata, how um, even their first fashion show was by a curator, I think that um, that you can see in many designers, um, but that's not something new. This has been happening for a really long time. And so I was uh, looking for a historic example that was very clear. And this is an exhibition that was curated by Ana Elena Malet a few years back in 2016 that looked at um, uh, Mexican fashion from 1945 to 2015. This garment is by Tao Itzo and it's from the 1950s. He designed this dress for Silvia Pinal, who was a mega star in Latin America at the time. Um, and at the time also Diego Rivera painted a portrait of um, Silvia Pinal wearing this dress. And so Silvia preserved the dress and the painting and, and it just, I think it really speaks to the fact that these designers were working both with these artists and they also knew the painters. And if you look at designers from the era, some of them were um, anthropologists or they were traveling throughout the country documenting traditional dress or, you know, um, so there was this broad uh, look of what fashion could connect with. And I think a little bit of that spirit has stayed in Mexican fashion. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is really great. So in this particular dress, oh, I see it's actually, yes, it's uh, uh, closely echoed in the paint. It is that paint, it is from that painting. That's so- Yes, and there are pictures of Silvia Pinal posing for Diego Rivera with, in this dress. I mean, Silvia Pinal, who's still alive, um, loaned this dress to the exhibition. It's just, and the, and the painting. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's remarkable too that the star was able to have them, um, what is the word, to think ahead and think that both the dress in conjunction with her painting were going to be valuable as, as a set. I always love seeing that in a museum, you know, when you see, when you can see the old painting and then you can see the actual dress and kind of see what the artist did to make it, you know, come to life in the, in the work. What else? So you, some, you had some other images too. Yes. Let's see. Um, so the next image is uh, a picture of Carla Fernandez, the person that I did my thesis about, and here she is in her house. Um, so I, want, I, I really like this picture because I think it, um, it encapsulates another aspect of Mexican fashion, which is that we are always in this dialogue between tradition and modernity. And um, so the tunic that she's wearing is a design um, that she did in her brand. And this is the, a map of the Americas, and it's made up of all the um, original languages that are still spoken in our continent. Mm -hmm. And she did this design um, to bring attention to the fact that we are a very di linguistically diverse continent. Um, and that um, that we shall not forget that we might speak Spanish in Mexico, but there's many other languages that are still spoken and that are still very important to us. But also, if you see um, her surroundings, her house is, is this brutalist building that is very modern, very stark, and this library that they, um, her husband is uh, Pedro Reyes, the artist, that sculpture that she's leaning on is a sculpture by Pedro. Um, and they loan their books to whomever wants to request a loan through Instagram. And they have like this system, even during the pandemic, where you can read about whatever it is that they have in their massive library. Um, but I think that while they're dealing with, um, you know, uh, traditional languages or indigenous communities, it's also these 
very modern look in everything that they produce. And, and the same, I think, happens with Julian Renata. When you think of that um, white garment, it did not have a very traditional look, yet it was, um, it was making direct reference to traditional costume. And so I think that that is another um, characteristic of contemporary Mexican fashion. Um, yes, yeah. the, the next image, I, um, I wanted to go in a slightly different direction when talking about Mexico. Um, and that is, this is um, Ricardo Seco. He is uh, Mexican born, but he's based in New York City. And we can see on the left, this pair of sneakers that he designed and then was invited by New Balance to create, um, uh, uh, what is it called? Like he did a more detailed design for his collection and then more massively, uh, like the, what you could sell to the masses version. So this is that. And again, this design was developed in collaboration with artisans in Northern Mexico who work with beading. Ah. Um, we had a pair of these beaded sneakers in the collection of the museum at FIT. So while you have the very traditional technique, I mean, this design is contemporary enough for New Balance to sell it to anybody who wants to buy a pair of sneakers. Mm. Um, but next to it, um, the red coat that we see on this photograph was designed by Ricardo in 2016 after Donald Trump was elected president. And this collection was he he has become very um he's learned the signif the significance of being an immigrant and and it has become part of the dna of his brand to speak to the realities of um the immigrant mexicans who can come here the first generation immigrants and so this code for example are words by an uh, a mexican president from the 1800s who said respect between countries is um, and uh, respect of somebody else's rights is peace. Mm -hmm. And just as he had this code, he also had codes with the American flag, with sayings in, uh, from American history. And his whole idea was that our countries can be friends rather than foes. Um, and so again, we see a referencing of either our traditional um present or our history mm. in um, these garments that are meant for consumption yes yeah mm -hmm. oh, it also seems like a slightly political awareness too mm -hmm. just in this case uh, in this case and i think ricardo seco is not afraid to be overtly political i think <laughs> he he has embraced that which he didn't do in mexico it, that's so interesting to me mm. mexico his fashions were were not at all mm. but i think he's found a voice in in the united states that i think he thought was important yes yeah mm -hmm. and the next image if i remember correctly is another <laughs> mexican designer from mexico city um, who's based in new york city he's based in brooklyn victor barragan um, his brand is called Barragan. And what happened to Victor is slightly different from Ricardo in that Ricardo was a very well known and established designer in Mexico when he decided to move his brand to New York. But Victor never had found um, success in Mexico because he was misunderstood. He really loves um, streetwear and, you know, his, his brand is all about nightlife and partying and uh, crossing gender boundaries. And Mexican fashion can sometimes be much more conservative than that. Mm -hmm. And so he said, OK, there's no voice for me here. I'm moving to New York. And he came here and he's been so successful in New York in such a short amount of time. He was um, a finalist for the CFDA not long ago. Um, this image it was taken. Uh, showing his uh, a tribe that he created in New York for himself, because at first he was really lonely, and then he started finding all these um, soulmates in New York, in in Williamsburg or Flush, I don't know, somewhere in, in Brooklyn. Some and, and so this is, these are his New York people, which I just think is. It, now I'm assuming he's the one in the white uh, suit. He's the one in the suit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and everybody Tanya, else is dressed in his designs. 
I just want to say one thing. If I seem distracted, it's because I'm trying to see the questions on my phone because I think people will be asking questions, but I'm paying attention. I'm here. I just just need you to know <laughs> that as usual. Okay. Uh, it's hard for me to see the questions. So if someone is monitoring them, you can text them. You could maybe text them to me because I can't see what they are. Okay, um, keep going. I'm sorry, there sure. you have more images. The, I have this... more questions. And I think yes. that if we um, get questions from the audience, I can like we can uh, go from yes. questions yes. to images. Um, the next image, I'm trying to remember who I put next. Ah, oh, I love Sanchez game. She mm. is uh, the woman in the blue suit who's sitting down there. She um, she again, she's based in Mexico City. She's from Merida, which is a, a, a city in the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, her clothes deal with issues of gender mostly, but she also um, has very detailed techniques. So when you see the garments that she designs, like this jacket that she's wearing, has these roses and, and she's constantly um, being kind of con contrary to conservative mores because Mexico is a very Catholic country and can have swatches of the population that are very conservative. And I think both her and Barragan are responding to this conservatism and they're trying to propose a, a different kind of fashion that not, might not necessarily be for the ladies who lunch. Hmm. I love yeah. this, uh, the blue, uh, I guess it's, I'm not sure what the shapes are in the, uh, it's like the bodice of the jacket, the seated mm -hmm. one. Yeah, they're like they're roses, but then you can like untie them and they become like these long pieces. Um, so, and this is uh, this is a jacket that can be worn by a woman or a man. In this case, um, Barbara is the one wearing them. Very and cool. Can we look at the next picture? And I wanted to show. Um, I thought that. Um, both Sanchez Spain and um, Barragan were very like streetwear type of brands. Uh, and Cancino, Francisco Cancino first worked at a brand called uh, Yacampot and now has his brand called Cancino. And he is inspired by literature, music, and nature from Mexico that translates into these beautiful pleadings, for example. He's from Chiapas in southern Mexico. So he grew surrounded by traditional textiles. It's a state that has a, an abundance of um, traditional techniques. And some of these techniques, such as the pleading that we see on this uh, red shirt, are a direct influence, if not reference, uh, of traditional pleading, as we saw in Julia Renata. Yes. So this is a different style of pleading. Um, a much more detailed that it's from the highlands in Chiapas. And um, we have this very practical, uh, but very meticulously made dress that, uh, that has an overskirt, even though it's not very clear on this picture. And so he always um, plays with, with um, the characteristics of the fabrics and how they, um, how they change based, uh, depending on how he's wearing them. So for example, he had a whole collection recently on um, this uh, cotton, what is this very basic cotton that we make twirls with? Muslin. Muslin. So the whole collection made with muslin, and and it was just like a, um, a, a homage to muslin and all the beautiful things that we can do with it. That is also considered a very iconic fabric in Mexico because a lot of designers historically have used it for resort wear. Right. Right. Wow. And, and then I, I, my last picture is an image of the brand Petra. Um, the designer for Petra is Montserrat Alvarez, and she um, formerly was a very well-known internationally contemporary art curator. And she one day decided that she didn't want to be a curator anymore, that, that her real passion and what she needed to do in life was to become a fashion designer. And so her clothes are obviously very intellectual. And I wanted to show this image of um, one of her collections and she presented it as part of a performance art piece in an art fair in, uh, in Buenos Aires, where the model would 
put on the, uh, all the clothes in that rack that were the whole collection, and she would um, iron them, put them on, take them off, look at herself in a mirror, and then go and do the same with different garments in different iterations. But also visitors to the art fair could do the same. Um, so it was a participatory um, in installation slash performance art slash uh, fashion show. Mm. Um, and I think, again, it's this porosity between uh, art and fashion and culture and ideas that I think are so characteristic of Mexican fashion. I th it's it, you've really shown us a, such a you know a broad like swath of fascinating artifacts and stories. We already do have a, a question actually, which relates, um, which is: Do you have any book or magazine recommendations so I can learn more about Mexican fashion? Um, books. If you read Sp uh, Spanish, there's a book that was printed some time ago called Mextilo, M-E-X-T-I-L-O. Um, and it's a compendium of many um, books uh, and publications that have been created in Mexico over centuries. So that gives you a nice overview of designers, but also of the writing that has been done in the country. It was done by Gustavo Prado, who has a company called Trendo. Um, mm. I think that Vice in the United States does a really good job at um, writing about Mexican fashion. Hmm. Um, obviously, hmm. Vogue Latin America and Harper's Bazaar and um, Elle magazine in Mexico are really good sources. There is uh, someone who works in Elle, the deputy editor. She did a, a program in London that's uh, similar to what we studied at FIT. And so she has a very keen visions um, and her writing is, is, is wonderful. Um, but I think it depends on, on the, and there is a, obviously uh, Regina Roots, um, the Latin American fashion reader, um, which has its, its um, multiple essays about not only Mexican, but uh, Latin American historic and contemporary fashion. Um, you have another question. Uh, someone wanted to know where to learn the pleating technique, and I'm assuming the pleating technique um, uh, that was in one of the previous images. I think the, the image right before this. I think this is the pleating technique they're asking about. Do you know you where? You know, I don't know. We, I could ask uh, Francisco if he he used to teach at a school in Mexico. I don't think he teaches there anymore. Um, but I know um, other designers in Mexico who do workshops where they teach certain techniques that they've learned from indigenous communities. And Carla Fernandez also um, does workshops in her, but they, she does them in her shops in Mexico. I don't know if now with the pandemic, um, she, she will be doing more online events. Um, so if you're based in Mexico, I would say probably, um, I know Carla, there's, um, Vargas, Guillermo Vargas from Juanita Takamura, who also teaches, um, who else, Fran, Fran, but I don't know if Fran still teaches anywhere, um, who would be able to teach some of these techniques. Okay, um, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure I understand exactly what they're asking, but I'll, the person is saying, I wanted to ask your perspective on the current presentation of Mexican fashion and dress in museums in the United States? <laughs> I think that um, there's, uh, we need more, uh, more representation of Mexican fashions in museums in general. And mm. I think in the United States, we also have the Mexican American population that needs to be further represented in our museums. So this person might refer to Mexican, like the country Mexico, but they might also uh, refer to Mexican American, like Ricardo and uh, Barragan, who are based in New York, can uh, like they are kind of Mexican, but they can also be considered American brands. Um, so I, I I think that it will be wonderful if more and more museums include the work of Mexican designers or uh, and Mexican creativity. Right, we have the looks of. Um, Latinx communities that have been borrowed, co-opted, um, reproduced, and designed 
Um, and sometimes we forget that they might have a certain heritage. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if we saw more of that for sure. Well, they, they will also need, need to make sure they have curators like yourself. <laughs> This is where we're, we're plotting out your future job path here uh, <laughs> to to make sure that it's done done accurately and correctly. Thank you for that. Um, one more. If you uh, did you do you have any advice on conducting research on a subject that isn't a current focus in the field? And I'm assuming they need in the field of uh, fashion studies. Does so, do you, Go ahead. Uh -huh. Current, I guess if uh, if current means as contemporary fashion, and if you're if someone is interested in historic fashion from yeah. Mexico, um, I think that is one of the areas where you would need to get a research grant and uh, go look at primary sources in Mexico because all the most of the historic um, archives are not digitized mm -hmm. to a degree that would be useful. Uh, to research long distance. Even I have like 1970s, 60s, sometimes I have, when I go to visit, when I come to Mexico to visit my family, I have to abandon them for three or four days and uh, dive in a library and my parents resent me for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a couple of minutes left. I actually wanna ask a question, but I wanna make sure that we have a moment for you to to just tell the audience that you're doing an event next Thursday, which I think is equally fascinating about Frida Kahlo and representations of disability. Can you talk a little yes, bit about and So uh, Circe Enestrosa, who is also Mexican born, but she's now based in Singapore, um, curated um, the exhibitions that we've seen around the world of uh, Frida Kahlo's wardrobe, the one that we had in the Brooklyn Museum. And we are going to be having a conversation uh, from her experience with Frida, uh, Frida Kahlo, her use of uh, clothes to, um, to work with the, her own disability. She has uh, done more and more research on that arena. So we're going to be discussing that research that she's done. It's going to be a fascinating event, um, March 11th, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And you, on the Museum of FIT's YouTube, which is open to everyone. But if you want to chat, you have to have a, an account. <laughs> ah, okay, cool. All right, I'm going to ask the last question. This is, I think this is the last one. Yeah. Apparently we have a lot of nice comments in the chat, which we'll see later. Um, what do you think is the future? Like, how do you think that um, Mexican fashion will be, you know, changing or adapting or presented in a different way in the future? Do, do you think that things will change? I, I think that, um, since uh, my youth, when there were no uh, BA programs in fashion in Mexico, now we have a completely different um, situation where there are undergraduate programs, where there are graduate programs, where there are um, graduate programs on fashion and design um, studies. And so I think that that makes the world a world of difference when people are taking a discipline more, more ser seriously enough to develop an academia around it. So I am, um, I do think that that's going to change uh, the path of Mexican fashion in, in ways that it's probably a little difficult to uh, point out, but I do see that there's more publications that are coming out from Mexico than there ever were. There are a lot of academic conversations, there's symposia, there's colloquia, there are um, closed groups, open groups, where the conversation is taken very seriously. And I think once you have um, research, it really helps consolidate a lot of ideas that sometimes get dispersed easily. If you, it, it's important to have a memory of the production of one's country for it not to disappear. It, it's so easy to forget because fashion is so ephemeral. That was a perfect answer, Tanya. Thank you so much. It has been a complete privilege to have your attention and your presence on our show. Uh, thank you so much for showing up and thanks to the audience. It was really kind of you to drop by and listen in. If you have thoughts on other visitors and guests you'd like me to have on the show, please send me an email. My email is alexander underscore joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, at fitnyc.edu. And I look forward to seeing you at future Hue Live conversations. Thank you all so much. Thank you again, Tanya. 
Good night. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.